This is the ISS, the biggest and most complex structure humanity has ever assembled in space. Racing around the planet at 28,000 km per hour, 400 km above Earth, completing a full orbit every 90 minutes. One of the most ambitious engineering projects in history, built by 15 nations, including the US and Russia. A transnational, cutting-edge research outpost. A fragile diplomatic island floating in a deadly void. Zero atmosphere, crushing cold and scorching radiation, and debris traveling faster than bullets. The margin of error up here is razor thin. Every system must function perfectly. Docking maneuvers are high-stakes operations. On a good day, the ISS crew monitors climate change and performs research that could change life on Earth. But on a bad day, they have to use duct tape to fix a high-voltage solar panel dangling from a robot arm in the deadly vacuum of space. Burn. This is Mark. His character is based on the experiences of actual astronauts. But we made him up to spacewalk you through a typical day aboard the ISS. Well, almost typical. We've spiced things up by condensing several real events into one high-stakes, action-packed day in orbit. Mark is one minute away from waking up, oblivious to the chaos that awaits him later. Floating in a sleeping bag strapped to the wall of his light and windowless personal cabin. The lights are off to provide some much-needed biorhythm. The station hurdles through space at 28,000 km per hour. Every 45 minutes, the sun either goes up or down. That's 16 days squeezed into 24 hours. 6 a.m. sharp. Time to rise. It's Wednesday and Mark has got 10 hours of work ahead. His first challenge is waking up in zero gravity. He pulls out his earplugs. The constant hum of fans and machines is as loud as a busy city street. Without ventilation, the CO2 exhaled by Mark would linger around his head and suffocate him in his sleep. In zero gravity, fluids are not pulled down by weight. Faces puff and noses run. Toilets rely on suction to keep certain things from floating. Most of the human deposits end up in sealed bags. They're vacuum dried, wrapped in waste capsules and shot to space. Some of them burn up in the atmosphere like shooting stars. Make a wish. Mark wipes himself down. There are no showers up here because water is precious. Nearly all of it is recycled, from sweat, breath and even urine. A high-tech filtration system turns 98% of it back into drinking water, at least 6,000 liters per year. Mark uses that system to fill a drinking pouch. He gets dressed in the same clothes he's worn for days. His dirty laundry also turns into a potential shooting star. He doesn't need a sweater anyway. This part of the station has been facing the sun for a while and the outer hull is scorching at 120 degrees Celsius. Inside, the thermal control system is working at full power to keep the crew from getting baked. The passive system relies on insulation, surface coatings, heaters and heat pipes to balance extreme temperatures. The active system uses water and ammonia. Water-based cooling loops absorb heat loads generated by the crew and electronic equipment. The heat is transferred to heat exchangers and passed to ammonia circuits that pump it out to giant radiators which then release it into space. The TCS keeps inside temperatures at a manageable maximum of 24 degrees Celsius. And they never go below 18, even when the ISS swings into Earth's shadow where temperatures drop to a crushing minus 160 degrees. On the ISS, survival depends on remote control, from managing CO2 to circulating air. When we travel and separate from the precious processing power of our editing rig, things tend to feel just as dramatic. That's why we use AnyDesk. AnyDesk gives us fast and secure remote access to our desktops, whether we are editing videos, troubleshooting hardware, or transferring massive project files. With AnyDesk, you can literally move your office anywhere you want. Well, almost. AnyDesk's proprietary codec keeps visuals sharp and latency low, even on bad hotel Wi-Fi. Audio pass-through means you can remotely edit sound in real time. 
You can even remotely control 3D printers from a Raspberry Pi or legacy system. It's lightweight, privacy-respecting, and engineered for professionals who rely on speed and stability. And it runs on almost anything, from Windows and Mac OS to Linux, iOS, and even retro systems like Windows XP. Try AnyDesk for free at anydesk.com slash fern to work with almost zero gravity. But first, breakfast. Mark has no idea how much he'll need it today. Scrambled eggs rehydrated from a plastic pouch. Coffee is a small miracle though. Mark can actually sip it from a specially designed zero gravity cup. The liquid literally clings to the rim and climbs into his mouth via surface tension. He shares this moment with Dimitri, his coffee buddy and crewmate from Russia. Despite war, sanctions and decades of mistrust, Russians and Americans still work on this station together. A fragile alliance held together by science, diplomacy and caffeine. The rest of the international crew trickles in. It mostly consists of fellow Americans and Russians, but there are also Europeans, Canadians and Japanese on board. Then comes the morning briefing. The crew discusses the daily agenda in a live feed with five ISS ground control centers around the world. The most pressing issue, one of the ISS solar panels is damaged. Two tears, one nearly a meter long. The station runs entirely on solar power. Reduced input means throttle systems and possible shutdowns. Someone will have to go out and fix it. The operation will go down as the most dangerous spacewalk in ISS history. The solar panels are life, 100 volts of raw current. The crew doesn't carry the necessary replacement parts nor proper tools. It's an extremely risky mission. US astronauts Scott Parazinski and Doug Wheelock volunteer for the job. But before the spacewalk, there's another high-stakes item on the agenda. A new Russian module is supposed to dock today, the Prishal. Normally, the crew would never schedule a module arrival and a spacewalk on the same day. But they are making an exception for our video. Two days earlier. This is the Baikonur Cosmodrome, a launch site in the middle of the Kazakh steppe. It's operated by Russia's space agency Roscosmos. On the pad is a Soyuz 2 carrier rocket. Strapped to its top is the MS-17 spacecraft carrying the heart of the mission, the four-ton Prishal Note module. The spacecraft starts separating from the rocket at 193 kilometers altitude. The capsule begins its orbital ballet, carefully aligning itself with the ISS's trajectory. It takes two full days to get close. Now the distance is down to just 200 meters. Mark and the entire team hold their breath, either floating in space or glued to screens on Earth. The range is showing 100 meters. 65 meters now separating Prishal. Our range is about 30 meters. The target is toward the bottom uh, by about two degrees. Uh, the crosshairs are aligned, copy. The docking runs on full autopilot. Our range is about 20 to zero. Copy, continue. And we're going to continue monitoring the automatic approach. Closing at a rate of one-tenth of a meter per second. I see the target. Uh, the roll is about 30, 30 degrees. The range is about eight meters. The final approach begins. Three degrees to the left, to the bottom. Uh, to the bottom one degree, we, we have contact. Contact confirmed. Done. Prishal has locked into place. This is what the ISS looks like today. 16 pressurized modules where the crew can float around with our spacesuits. The backbone holding it all together is the integrated truss structure. A linear, arranged sequence of 11 steel trusses that carries unpressurized components like the solar panels and connects them to the pressurized modules. This was the first module, Zarya. 12.6 meters long, weighing 20 tons, built in Russia. The Americans added the connecting node Unity shortly after. The first living quarters called Zvezda arrived in July 2000. That's when the first three astronauts could finally move in. 
It took over 40 shuttle flights and more than 20 years to put together the ISS in its current form. The station roughly splits into two main blocks, one Russian and one American. The Europeans plucked in Columbus and the Japanese added their Kibo laboratory. But the real showstopper is Canadarm2, a 16-meter robotic arm that can grab modules, move them around and hold astronauts during spacewalks. It can relocate itself along the station and move to wherever it's needed. The ISS features six research labs, two living quarters and a panoramic observation cupola, plus endless connecting nodes, storage compartments and technical systems. The interior volume is about the size of a Boeing 747. With its solar arrays fully extended, the station covers a surface area of roughly 7,000 square meters. 260,000 solar cells across 2,500 square meters constantly rotate to track the sun. Backup batteries take over whenever the station swings into Earth's shadow. Mark and the crew welcome the new module aboard. Prishal's got six docking ports for more modules and Russian spacecrafts to plug in later. Everything is running smoothly. Time for some science. These are mice, 15 of them. They'll never understand why they suddenly started floating, but they're part of a groundbreaking experiment. These mice were injected with special antibodies back on Earth. Mark observes how those antibodies affect their bone growth and zero gravity. Weightlessness tends to accelerate bone loss, so these are the perfect conditions to stress test potential treatments. In fact, this very experiment will directly contribute to developing prolia, a drug used to combat osteoporosis on Earth. Next stop, plants. This little weed is Arabidopsis thalania, also known as thale cress or mouse ear cress, an inconspicuous species on Earth, but a star up here in space. Plants usually exhibit growth responses to light and gravity but in orbit, gravity disappears. So what happens? On Earth, roots spiral down and leaves reach up. In space, the plant goes wild, growing everywhere at once. The ISS crew is constantly conducting research from physics experiments to biomedical studies that may one day help treat cancer or heart disease. Some of that science could change life on Earth. But now, something else demands Mark's attention. The most dangerous spacewalk in ISS history. This is Scott Parazinski, the real astronaut behind the spacewalk. It will be the most important EVA or extravehicular activity of his career. His colleague Doug Wheelock will assist him from the truss. Right now they're inside the Quest module, that's the airlock. The pressure inside is slowly dropping to match the cosmic vacuum outside. They secure their safety tethers to make sure they won't drift off into the abyss. Then the hatch opens and they step out into space. They're heading toward the torn solar array. They have no proper tools or replacement parts. Just five makeshift braces they MacGyver together with aluminium stripes, wire and duct tape. No one knows if it'll even work. The panels are still live with 100 volts of exposed current. An electric shock could be fatal. Every single metal part of Scott's suit and tools has been triple wrapped in insulating tape. And then there's the distance. The damaged panel is farther from the airlock than any ISS astronaut has ever ventured. Scott will be the first. The Canadarm is too short, so the crew added a 15 meter extension. That makes it even more difficult for Mark and his crewmate to guide the arm from the inside. Scott's boot is locked in. The arm begins its slow crawl toward the damaged solar panel. It takes some time. Scott is suspended over Earth, floating around 400 kilometers above the Amazonian rainforest. Looks like they've got nice weather down there. He feels like a tiny worm stuck to a fishing rod strapped to a metal beam, extended into infinity. 
overcomes his crewmates walk him through the list of dangers to consider, like sharp edges and the life voltage. Then he finally arrives. The tear is right there. Scott gets to work. Again, everyone is holding their breath, aboard the ISS and on the ground. They are watching Scott's every move in total silence. One by one, he slips the handmade braces through the holes in the fabric, like cufflinks pinning fragile metal into place. It works. The braces hold. The entire crew breathes a sigh of relief. The ISS has been up here for more than 25 years, and it's starting to show its age. The AC keeps botching and the oxygen system acts up. Sometimes air escapes and no one knows from where. By 2030, the 420-ton satellite will make its final descent into the ocean, a falling star guided back to its home planet, a planned and controlled closure to a stellar chapter of human collaboration and engineering. Mark is grateful for every minute in orbit, but he's also ready to come home, to his family, to gravity, and to a proper pizza. One that leaves crumbs everywhere. And, of course, a long, hot shower to rinse them off. Outside, the sun sets for the 13th time today. Good night, ISS.